Hello and welcome to another video. Today's topic is Mount Everest. I was 9 or 10 years old when I watched my first documentary about Everest and I was just so fascinated by the unparalleled beauty of the mountain and the courage of those who attempt to climb it. Although I knew it was the highest mountain on earth, I hadn't fully realized the scale of it. I just saw those slopes covered in snow and looking beautiful and as a young skier, naturally the only thing I wanted was to glide down that mountain. I then realized that that's not possible but my fascination or even obsession with Everest is still very much here. Anyway, I'll try to cover as much as I can in this video, um, general information about Everest, cost, deaths, high altitude medical issues and everything else in between. I will put the timestamps in the description box down below for those who are interested. Mount Everest, the highest mountain on Earth, was formed by the upward force generated when the Indian and Eurasian tectonic plates collided. Although the agreed height is 29,029 feet, or 8,848 meters, that force is still at work today, pushing Everest summit about a quarter of an inch higher every year. Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay were the first men to reach the summit in 1953, as part of the British expedition led by Lord John Hunt. There are 17 different routes that have been pioneered to the summit of Everest, but almost everyone climbs it via one of two routes. From Nepal there's the Southeast Ridge, the line created by Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary in 1953, and from Tibet there's the North Ridge, where George Mallory and Andrew Irvin disappeared in 1924, and a Chinese team finally completed the climb in 1960. Most expeditions to Everest take approximately two months. Climbers start arriving at the mountain's base camps in late March, and summit day is usually a date in mid-May, when the temperatures are warmer and the winds milder. The climbers usually begin at around midnight and aim to be on the summit in the morning, so they will have plenty of daylight left in order to get back down safely. Years ago, only the bravest and most experienced mountaineers attempted to climb to the top of Everest. However, in recent years, expeditions to Everest have become very popular, and even people with no mountaineering skills attempt to reach the summit, and they risk not only their own lives, but also the lives of the Sherpas who take them up the mountain. During the climbing season, it is now very common to be overcrowded. There are very few weather windows when it's optimal for climbers to make a push for the top, usually two or three days in May, which is why so many expeditions go for it at the same time. But when you have to wait in a queue for hours on end at such a high altitude, you risk to run out of oxygen or not have enough oxygen left for the way down. It is not enough to simply push yourself to your limits in order to reach the summit. You need to have enough energy, strength and oxygen in order to get back down safely. Furthermore, all those people leave behind tons of garbage. Last year alone, 24,200 pounds of garbage were pulled off the mountain during a 45-day cleanup expedition. The history of the attempts to climb Everest began with three British attempts in 1921, 1922 and 1924. George Mallory and Andrew Irvin went missing during a summit attempt on June 8, 1924, and they were last seen on the Upper Ridge, just 250 metres below the summit. The 1999 Mallory and Irvin research expedition set out to find the bodies of Mallory and Irvin 75 years after their disappearance. The expedition members searched the area and they found a number of bodies from fallen climbers, but the modern day clothing indicated that they had died recently. And then, one of them discovered an old body face down on the slope at 8,155 meters. They looked at the layers of clothing at the back of his neck and found the name tag, George Mallory. Every time I watch the video of the discovery and they go, it's George Mallory. Oh my God, oh my God. I'm also like, oh my God. That is amazing. They discovered his body 75 years after he died. I just, I can't even begin to imagine how they must have felt at that moment. I would have probably passed out from excitement. Mallory's almost perfectly preserved body was found tangled in a snapped rope, which means that he was roped to Irving. One of his legs was broken and his hands still gripped the mountainside. To this day, we still don't know whether Mallory and Irving reached the summit. However, Mallory intended to place a photograph of his wife Ruth on the top of Everest, but no photograph of Ruth was found on Mallory's body. Personally, I do believe that they reached the summit. As I said before, there's no evidence, so we cannot be sure, but my instinct tells me that they did it. Mallory was once asked why he wanted to climb Everest, and this extraordinary mountaineer simply replied, because it's there. And those have been called the most famous three words in mountaineering. 
1953, a British expedition attempted to scale Everest. The first attempt was not successful, so Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay were chosen for the second attempt. On May 29, 1953, at 11.30 in the morning, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay were the first people to reach the highest point on Earth. Hillary took a photograph of his partner holding an ice pick on the top of Mount Everest, and after 15 minutes, they descended. Although they both agreed not to reveal who was the first one to reach the summit, Tenzing Norgay later confirmed in his autobiography that Hillary was indeed first. You can find the link to a very interesting documentary in the description box down below about their historic ascent on Everest. What an achievement! Rob Hall was a mountaineer from New Zealand and the head guide of the Adventure Consultants 1996 expedition to Everest. Rob Hall had actually summited Everest five times before he died on the mountain in 1996. On May 10th, shortly after midnight, the Adventure Consultants expedition, along with climbers from other expeditions, left Camp 4 and began a summit attempt. Due to various delays they encountered, most of them had not reached the summit by 2 o'clock, which was the last safe time to turn around and descend to Camp 4. Some of them decided to return, some of them decided to continue climbing. One of them was Doug Hansen, and Rob Hall decided to help his client reach the summit, even though it was getting quite late, and eventually they reached the top. At 5 o'clock a blizzard struck Everest and Rob radioed for help because Doug could not continue anymore, they could not come down and he refused to leave his client alone and return to the camp. At 5.30 another guide, Andy Harris, began a rescue attempt. On May 11th, around 4.45 in the morning, almost 12 hours after the blizzard had started, Rob radioed down and told them that Andy Harris and Doug Hansen were both gone. He was still stuck up there and that afternoon he radioed base camp again and asked them to call his pregnant wife Chan on the satellite phone and during their last communication he told You know what, I can do a hundred takes and I will tear up every single time So I'm afraid there's no way around it, I'm sorry um, So during their last communication he told her Sleep well my sweetheart Please don't worry too much, and he died shortly after that. His body remains on the mountain and seven other people died along with Rob Hall during the uh, 1996 Everest disaster. The film Everest brings to life the tragic events that occurred back in 1996 and I first watched it at the cinema and I believe it was in 3D and it just felt so real, I felt like I was there, I felt like I was part of their team and it can be quite hard to watch, I'm not going to lie, but if you're interested in learning more about this story then I highly highly recommend it because it truly is a very well made film. So how much does it cost to climb Everest? Well, it depends and prices are going up every year, but it is estimated that the minimum amount is approximately $40,000 and some might even pay as much as $160,000. Now, where does all that money go, you may be wondering? Well, travel, which is entirely dependent on where you live and how you choose to travel to Nepal. From Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, you need to fly to Lukla, and when you get there, you need to travel to base camp, and that trek lasts a little over one week, and you have to carry all your equipment, tents, oxygen, food, if you choose to use porters or yaks to carry your equipment to base camp, you'll have to pay at least $20 per day per load, and that might cost over $1,000 in total. Permits and insurance. From Nepal, the permit cost is fixed at $11,000 per climber. Nepal requires using a local company to organize your permit at a cost of $2,500 for the team, a trust deposit of $4,000 per permit, plus a liaison officer costing $3,000 per team. Most guide companies on the Nepal side require at least evacuation insurance and most of them require medical coverage as well. Supplies and gear. Every climber needs climbing gear like high altitude boots, gloves, oxygen masks and bottles, sleeping bags, clothing layers, packs, a downsuit, tents and more. Guides. There are three options for supported climbs. Sherpa supported, Sherpa guided and a western guided commercial expedition. These are usually more appropriate for those who are attempting to climb Everest for the first time and feel like they need a little bit more support. Now let's talk about all the medical problems that can occur while you climb Everest. Acclimatization is very important but also time consuming. Moving too high too fast can lead to high altitude sicknesses 
which is why ascending more than 2,000 feet a day is not recommended. The body needs to be given enough time to adjust to the lower pressure and oxygen levels. At high altitude, oxygen is in short supply, air pressure is low and the air is thinner. Oxygen deprivation or hypoxia can lead to altitude sickness, which has three forms. Acute mountain sickness or AMS, which is a mild altitude sickness that causes fatigue, headache and nausea. This is quite common, but if you have AMS you should be careful because you might be at risk of the most serious forms of altitude sickness, which can be fatal, high altitude pulmonary edema and high altitude cerebral edema. High altitude pulmonary edema is basically when fluid accumulates in the lungs and they can open up and fill with air when you try to breathe. It usually develops after two or three days at altitudes above 2500 meters. When a person has hape, they are usually weak and breathless, have blue lips, cough often, experience tightness in the chest and might produce bloody sputum. The breathlessness continues even when the person is simply resting, the heart starts beating faster and the temperature of the body might be elevated. Hape is fatal within hours, so the person must descend to a lower altitude as quickly as possible. High altitude cerebral edema is the buildup of liquid in the brain which can actually swell and is also fatal within a few hours. The symptoms are vomiting, failure of motor function, severe headaches, hallucinations, confusion, unsteadiness and ultimately coma. If a person starts behaving in a bizarre way and they can't walk in a straight line, then they are most probably suffering from haste and they should be moved to a lower altitude immediately. Other risks to Everest climbers include hypothermia and frostbite due to the extreme temperatures. Hypothermia is also extremely dangerous and can kill in only a few hours. Due to the cold temperature, the body loses heat very quickly and you start to shiver. If your body temperature drops below 35 degrees Celsius, the shivering stops and you start getting dizzy. Because the body is trying to maintain heat around the most important organs like heart, brain and lungs, blood circulation to the arms and legs shuts down. At 30 degrees Celsius, your pulse is weak and slow and you start feeling very hot and want to remove all your clothes. Falling into unconsciousness is what comes next and at 24 degrees Celsius the heartbeat finally stops. And we also have frostbite which usually occurs in the hands, feet, nose and ears. In response to such extreme temperatures the body narrows the blood vessel so the blood flow to the extremities is slowed down because as we said before the body prioritizes the vital organs. So as a result the tissue in your extremities turns white and you can't feel it anymore until eventually the tissue dies and turns black, blisters and falls off. The first question which you will ask and which I must try to answer is this, what is the use of climbing Mount Everest? And my answer must at once be, it is no use. There is not the slightest prospect of any gain whatsoever. Or we may learn a little about the behaviour of the human body at high altitudes and possibly medical men may turn on observation to some account for the purposes of aviation. But otherwise nothing will come of it. We shall not bring back a single bit of gold or silver, not a gem, nor any coal or iron. We shall not find a single foot of earth that can be planted with crops to raise food. It's no use. So, if you can't understand that there is something in man which responds to the challenge of this mountain and goes out to meet it, that the struggle is the struggle of life itself, upward and forever upward, then you won't see why we go. What we get from this adventure is just sheer joy. And joy is, after all, the end of life. We do not live to eat and make money. We eat and make money to be able to enjoy life. That is what life means and what life is for.